I, uh, I love it when Rick Iflin comes to uh, speak at Westmont. He's done it once or twice before. Uh, Rick is, uh, well, he, he's a graduate of Westmont. He and his wife are. Rick has been an entrepreneur since his junior year at Westmont, which is, this is, that's so Westmont. <laughs> you guys do that. And Rick's been doing it, and he's still doing it. Uh, he earned his degree in business and economics here at Westmont, went on to get an MBA at the University of Kentucky, and, uh, and a doctorate at the uh, University of Oxford, that little college over there in England that you may have heard of. Uh, Rick continues to do amazing and wonderful things uh, with the poor, uh, with the illiterate women in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, helping them get out the vote, uh, and stemming the tide of HIV AIDS in Africa. Uh, Rick is a creative man. He's a man of God and of great wisdom. Uh, his children have all gone here. He has a son here right now. He met his wife here. Uh, so there's lots of reasons to have Rick. I just want you to know, I, I, I want him here because I just, I just like him so much. He's just a good man and a good brother and a great encouragement to us uh, as he serves as a trustee here at Westmont. Uh, but is really just a, a brother in Christ. So Rick, uh, I welcome you in the name of Christ. And Run down the path that God set for you this morning. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Ben, that was an awesome introduction. Thank you for only telling them about the good stuff, <laughs> leaving out all the bad stuff. Who knew that speaker introductions were a lot like first dates? <laughs> Well, it is a, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and somewhere out there, I have a son who's in the house. In the, when I told Crawford rather proudly that I'd been asked to speak in chapel this morning, he looked at me with that distinctive, disbelieving expression that you young people are so good at, and he was too kind to say it, but I know what he was thinking. You? Dad, you can't even change the ink cartridges on our printer. <laughs> and it's a fair point. I do struggle with the ink cartridges in our printer. <clears throat> and I probably always will. Admittedly, there's so many things that I just don't know. Truth be told, um, I'm kind of dense, and there's no sense denying it. Nonetheless, as I thought about this morning, that there's one thing that I've done that neither Crawford nor any of you students have yet done. I've survived for 29 years since graduating from this place. And like anyone who's reached my time in life, I've learned a thing or two. I've learned that it's seldom a good idea to pull clothing over your head while driving down the 405. Um, I've learned that if you touch a surface to see if it's hot, it will be. <laughs> and I've learned that nearly all small animals want to bite me, and they, and they almost always will. And I've learned these things through a long process of trial and error, so I feel I've, <clears throat> I've acquired a unique form of wisdom, the kind that comes from doing things, stupid things, over and over and over again until it hurts so badly that I just stop. Well, my method of learning is perhaps not, most, not the most efficient way of acquiring wisdom, but it does work for me. Plus, it's given me some really cool scars to show off at parties. Fortunately for you, my stupidity is not the central point this morning. I mean, I could share with you a hundred mistakes and not even scratch the surface of what you should try to avoid in life. But you don't need me to be telling you that or giving you advice. First, I'm old, so you think that I'm out of touch. And I probably am. Second, I don't know most of you, and so I haven't really earned the right to be heard. And third, I don't think you came here this morning to hear the lecture from a dad of one of your fellow classmates. So instead, as I, as I prayed about this morning and as I thought about what, you, what you'll likely face in your lifetimes, three questions kept coming to mind. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that each of you are going to have to have an answer to them if you want to effectively engage the world on the world's terms and yet still be salt and light once you, read, once you leave this place. The first question... Is knowledge enough? Is knowledge enough? I mean, you're spending about $200,000 for an education here. So you must be pretty serious about the acquisition of knowledge. And so are your professors. 
I did some quick research. Did you know that your professors collectively possess over 400, about 400 college degrees, including over 100 of them from, get this, Westmont, Wheaton, Calvin, Virginia, Johns Hopkins, Penn, USC, Emory, Texas, Michigan, UCLA, Berkeley, Cornell, Notre Dame, Princeton, Northwestern, Caltech, Duke. Okay, so Duke's not that impressive, but um, <laughs> Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, and Stanford. I mean, it's ridiculous. They're also best-selling authors, and they're world-class researchers, and they're phenomenal lecturers. It's impressive, to say the least. Then there's all of you, the students. Not to be outdone, roughly three out of four of you in this, in this room will go on to graduate school, many of you to some of the finest programs in the world. About 90% of you will have at least one significant international experience before you earn your degree. And if you look around, you're only a few feet away from a National Merit Scholar or a valedictorian. They're everywhere. 96% of you who want to go to medical school actually get in. Many of you to the very best programs. I could go on and on. In many ways, you're just as impressive as your professors. <clears throat> and then there's your president, who studied business management under Peter Drucker, the management guru of the 20th century. And he studied theology at Princeton, and he studied either theological philosophy or philosophical theology. I don't know the, I don't know the difference between either one of them. <clears throat> Dr. Beebe did that mostly by studying the lives of a bunch of dead guys. And he quotes them like they're long-lost friends, which in a really strange sort of way, they probably are. <clears throat> Gil, what an odd way to spend your leisure time. <laughs> I mean, personally, I like Sports Center. <clears throat> but my question remains, is knowledge enough? What if the, what you learn on this campus and in graduate school is simply a precursor to doing something that'll either be exceptionally foolish or very wise? Last month, my pastor stated, the world doesn't need more experts. It needs more examples. And I think he got it right. So when the knowledge has been obtained, how do you avoid turning it into a vehicle for foolishness? How do you assure that what you have learned will have eternal significance? Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Scripture is where you'll find wisdom. James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him and he'll gladly tell you. He tells you in the pages of the Bible. In Colossians 2.3, Paul says of Christ, in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So all the treasures of both wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus, and his life is on open display in the scriptures. In those pages, you'll learn that God designed the human machine to run on himself. He's the fuel that our spirits were designed to burn. It's been said that Christianity, if false, is of absolutely no value, but if true, is of infinite value. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And yet that's exactly what a large number of people believe today. People all around us, maybe even some of you. How foolish. As you seek wisdom from the scriptures, you'll learn and discover so many things. You'll discover God to be entirely sufficient, even when it seems like he's all that you have. You'll discover that God cannot give you joy and peace apart from himself because there is no such thing. You'll discover a Jesus who weeps for you and that qualifies him to wipe away your tears. You'll discover that he doesn't change, but you will. Look around, you're just one small part of a really great body of people trying to do what's right by using your gifts, including your mind, to love God and love people. If you want to have an eternal impact on those around you, it's not knowledge that does that. It's understanding and applying scripture. For example, so many of you are leaders. You want to be a better leader? Study the pages of the Bible, and you'll learn a lot about the attributes of some great leaders. 
you'll find that David was optimistic. Jonathan had such a great capacity to love others. Joseph shows us what integrity is like. Joshua was very decisive. Esther, courageous. Solomon, discerning. Jeremiah demonstrated emotional authenticity. Peter showed bold initiative. Paul pursued a life with such intensity. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on, but it's all there. It's right in front of us. Knowledge is wonderful, but wisdom is better. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. Read it. Study it. Apply it. It's the greatest book ever written, penned by the Holy Spirit himself. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. It's free food. So I hope that you decide to eat from his word often and eat a lot. The second question, is obedience optional? Assume for a moment that your formal education is over and that you've committed to daily Bible reading, which will teach you how to use what you've learned to best navigate your way through life. That's wisdom. And then God taps you on the shoulder and he says, I want you to trust me. I want you to go do this. Is obedience optional? I've seen a bunch of people, most people actually, disobey. And then they earnestly pursue money or success or possessions or status or power or prestige. And the end result is always the same. They feel empty inside. Do you know anybody like that? Then there are a few people I know who've really listened to God and they've embraced whatever they've been called to do in life. My wife, a Westmont alumna, was busy being a great mom to our three children and volunteering at our church. And then a few years ago, while reading the Word, she felt God's distinct voice leading her to get in a ministry that was way outside of her comfort zone. I mean, it was so outside her comfort zone, it was just laughable to us. She was obedient to his call, though. And if she were standing right here, she'd tell you that it's been completely worth it to obey God and that it's been a wonderful, wild ride with him. She now leads that ministry. It's an outreach to women in the adult entertainment industry. She and her team of church ladies, as they're called, ranging in age from 22 to 85, They go into the strip clubs each week and they develop relationships with the women in the clubs, quietly feeding them and loving them and serving them just as they are. (laughs) Showing them that they still have tremendous value in God's eyes. Those girls feel like the world's just beat them up and no longer cares. Well, guess what? Somebody does care. My wife and her team care. And they're having a lasting impact on those lives. <clears throat> My wife's just one example of courageous obedience derived from the wise application of Scripture. <clears throat> one person who's a quiet, but very effective leader. And I actually think that that's all of you too, if you learn to be obedient. I hope that you're wise enough to do that. Well, how do you do that? It's just a thought, but maybe it's time to discontinue the immature desire to be just like that cool person down the hall or to foolishly covet other people's lifestyles. We need you to be who you are. Absolutely follow the healthy passions that God's placed inside of you and then do it, whatever it is, and do it with excellence. There's nothing worse than getting to be my age and saying, I could have played second base for the Dodgers, but my dad wanted me to go into medicine. Go tell your dad to go into medicine. (laughs) You go and follow what God has placed in your heart with a mind committed to bringing glory to him in the process. Why do you need to be who God created you to be? 
because there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second, it's claimed by God and it's counterclaimed by his enemy. And you play an important role in that struggle. <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon once said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. It's your choice. So I gotta ask you, have you been holding back from a risky, perhaps costly course in life to which you know in your heart that God has called you to? Have you been holding back? Let me paraphrase J.I. Packer and say this to you. Hold back no longer. God is faithful to you and he's adequate for you. You'll never need more than he can supply and what he does supply, both materially and spiritually, it'll always be enough for the present. You see, God doesn't give strength on credit. He gives it at the moment that we need it. So move ahead. You'll have what you need. That's what I'd say to you. Along the way, you'll learn that courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the very form of every virtue at the testing point. Joshua 1.7 encourages us to be strong and very courageous. Study the scriptures. Meditate on them day and night. Don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So lean into your calling, because as one of my pastor friends says, you never honor God by suggesting plan B when he's asked you to obey plan A. A.W. Tozer once said, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity when we only plan or do the things that we can, we can um, accomplish by ourselves. Besides, and you know this already too, if you never venture into places that are difficult or challenging or seemingly impossible, how will you ever truly develop a faith in a God who can do anything? I mean, if God can order the universe, don't you think he can also order your steps? By the way, one of the great benefits of obedience is the presence of gratitude and joy. We all know, or most of us do anyway, that, that Jesus lived the life that, that we should be living. And he died the death that we should be dying. And that kind of love makes me so grateful to him. See, it's not joy that makes you grateful. It's gratitude that makes you joyful. The secret to having a joyful spirit is to be so grateful that you surrender yourself, your thoughts, your gifts, your resources, you surrender them to God. But beware if you do that, because knowing Jesus intimately will change your life completely. So is obedience optional? Not if you wanna serve the Lord instead of your own ego. Not if you want to make Jesus famous instead of yourself. Fortunately, obedience is not an obligation to endure or a curse to overcome. It's actually the first step in identifying your best contribution to God's plan. It's wisdom with hands and feet. Which leads me to my last question. Is fear dominant? Is fear dominant? Are you going to allow fear to sabotage your calling? Assuming that you commit to search the scriptures and you do that often and you learn how best to navigate your way through life and that you decide to be obedient to whatever God's calling you to do. Is there anything else that's in the way of an uncompromising pursuit to love God and love people? If there is, that obstacle is likely to be fear. And by fear, I don't mean a deep reverence or respect for God, though that's also important. I mean fear, the scary stuff. I think when we talk about fear, we also have to talk a little bit about how to overcome it. 1 Peter 5, 7 advises us to give all of our concerns to God because he cares what happens to us. Jesus in John 14, 1 said, don't be troubled, trust in me. I don't know where you are right now, but when I began to write down some of these thoughts, 
I found myself in a very terrified place. Wars, riots throughout the Arab world, massive starvation, a worldwide financial crisis, gridlock among seemingly incompetent politicians. For you, it's perhaps finding a job when the outlook is bleak at best, or not knowing how you're going to fund an expensive yet necessary education. And even some personal stuff that we carry around with us, you know what I mean, when, when things from your past just seem to crop up, or you're headed into a territory you never dreamed you'd be going in. You just get scared. Sometimes it starts with the little things. Other times you click on the television and something's taking place in the world and it just stops us all from breathing. And we're terrified. I found what really helps me when I'm most frightened and afraid is to read because good books often provide helpful insight. So I wanted to conclude by sharing with you a passage from an incredibly profound book that, to my knowledge, has never been read in chapel before. First, I want to thank Shonda Pierce, who years ago I heard share the same story with another audience. I'll tweak it a bit for this morning's message, but the insight originated from her, not from me. The book that I'm going to read from just might be filled with more knowledge and more wisdom than all of your current and prospective degrees put together. I just have a feeling that some of you need to hear this. Once upon a time, told you it was profound. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. Probably never heard that in chapel before. In fact, Dr. Beebe, for the record, this is a story about three famous dead guys who overcome fear with wisdom. <laughs> the three little pigs went out to seek their fortune. The first pig went off and met a man with... The, sorry. <laughs> There's a guy over there motioning for me to show him the pictures. <laughs> You're a first year, right? <laughs> Probably homeschooled. <laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, that might not be a student. It looks like Dr. Kilstrom. <laughs> anyway, the, the first pig went off and he met a man with a bundle of straw. And he said to the man, please man, can you give me that straw to build me a house with? So the man did, and the little pig built his house with it. Strange, he didn't even have to pay for it. <laughs> presently, that's a big word, presently along came the big bad wolf, and he knocked on the door, and he said, little pig, little pig, let me come in. You got that was weak. <laughs> no, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. That's very nice. So the wolf said, then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow the house. And you really are well read. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in. Such a heartbreaking book. <laughs> the second little pig met a man with a bundle of sticks and he said to the man, please man, give me those sticks to build me a house with. And the man did. Very kind-hearted men in this tale. <laughs> so the little pig built a house out of sticks. And along came the big bad wolf, and he knocked on the door, and he said, little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, not by the hair of my chinich. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he blew. Oh, that's terrible. Mm. The third little pig met a man with a load of bricks. Please, man, give me those bricks to build me a house with. So the man gave him the bricks to build a house with. Along came the big bad wolf, and he knocked on the door, and he said, Little pig, little pig, let me come. No, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house. You guys are getting better. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he... Nope. Whoa, 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 hold on. This is where it gets really good. So he huffed and he puffed and he huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed. But he could not blow the house down. 
Isn't that fantastic? I love that story. Well, let me read another story for you, and I like this one better. It comes from the message in Matthew chapter 7. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life or home improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter or a pig who built his house on solid rock and the rain poured down and the rivers flooded and the big tornado hit, big bad wolf showed up. But nothing moved that house because it was fixed to the rock. One of the greatest lessons that I've learned in life is that we cannot tell the wind to stop blowing, but we can hold on to the one who created the wind. We cannot alter many of the circumstances that may happen in our lives, but when fear sneaks in, we can run into the house, the one that we've built on the rock, built with tools like wisdom, because we know that knowledge alone is not enough and courage because we know that obedience is not optional. And even with the comfort and joy that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives, and then we don't have to be afraid. See, I believe a long time ago in the garden, God meant for things to be peaceful and good and joyful and kind and fun and intimate. And along the way, there was separation between God and man and fear entered the world, and it terrified us. Someday, we'll be with God again, and there'll be no more fear. Until then, we just need to keep building a stronger house, and we need to invite Jesus to come and live with us. And if we do that, we won't have to be afraid anymore. You see, without relationship with Jesus, we'll always feel incomplete there will always be fear in our lives. But with a relationship with Jesus, somehow, even in this broken world, with all of its problems, somehow we can feel complete again. And then we don't have to be afraid anymore. We never have to be afraid. Thank you.